All right, we are going to get started. It is 7.31 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you everyone for joining us today for this webinar on how to prevent activist burnout. My name is Greta Zaro and I'm the organizing director with World Beyond War. World Beyond War is a global grassroots network of volunteers, chapters, and allied organizations around the world advocating for the abolition of the institution of war and its replacement with a just and sustainable peace. We have members in 175 countries worldwide working to debunk the myths of war and advocate for its alternatives. And tonight's webinar was actually based on feedback from our chapters around the world who asked us to put something together on this topic. I'm also joined tonight by my new colleague, Rachel Small, based in Toronto, Canada, who is our new Canada organizer. Welcome, Rachel. Hi, all. Thanks for joining tonight. And we are joined by some really amazing guests today. We have David Hartso, who is a co-founder of World Beyond War. We have Raven Wings, who is a member of Black Lives Matter Toronto. Liz Remerswall, who is our New Zealand chapter coordinator. And Leah Bay, who is the co-founder of the Burnout Project. And we'll be talking about how to prevent burnout, how to stay motivated and inspired, despite the challenging issues that we're working on. We'll talk about you know, how to maintain good self-care and make sure that you're prioritizing yourself while doing this hard work and also how to stay organized and not feel kind of overwhelmed by all the emails coming in and all the petitions and kind of keeping organized and keeping strategic in our work. So we will go around uh, and we will ask questions to the panelists and each panelist will have an opportunity to answer the question. Um, and then after that, we'll open up to audience Q&A. Um, so we do encourage you to put your questions and comments in the chat box throughout the webinar. And then we will read those questions towards the end of the webinar. Um, so participants, you are muted throughout this webinar and we encourage you to make use of that chat box. Um, and we are also recording this webinar if you have to leave at any time. And we are live streaming it to World Beyond War's YouTube channel right now as well. So without further ado, um, my first question is for Leah. Um, Leah, I'm really curious about your organization, The Burnout Project, which deals you know, precisely with this topic that we're talking about tonight. So I'd love for you to explain you know, what is The Burnout Project, why did you found it, and kind of you know, what's it all about and what do you work on? Sure, thanks so much, Greta. And um, yeah, I, I really want to acknowledge World Beyond Award for hosting a webinar on this topic. I think it's, it's so important and prevalent yet. And um, it's one of the things that's really discussed. Um, so in terms of the Burnout Project, it's a organization that my friend Zoya Jiwa and I co-founded um, a couple of years ago now. Um, and we're an organization dedicated to supporting people who have experienced burnout. And we do so by partnering with mission-driven individuals and organizations to understand and prevent burnout. Um, and frankly, it, it came out of our own experiences. Um, I, I know myself, I have experience burnout majorly twice in my life and both times I didn't realize that that's what it was until afterwards and I think that's probably one of the most difficult things about burnout as well um, it, it can feel very isolating and um, we tend to withdraw and and not get our, our needs met during that process and because it feels so lonely we don't think that it's prevalent but and um, the fact that we're hosting this webinar today and uh, and I know hundreds of people have joined and, and I know it's a topic that's uh, not discussed enough and there's not enough language and capacity building around it. So we, we kind of saw a, a gap, if you will, there and, and realized that a lot of people could use this work. Um, just a quick follow up question for you is, you know, what does that work look like kind of on a day to day basis in terms of the support that you're providing to these individuals and organizations that are experiencing burnout? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so in terms of uh, how how we approach burnout, so um, for a little bit of context, burnout um, being as prevalent as it is, it's been classified as an occupational phenomenon by the World Health Organization um, in 2019. Um, and and when when the WHO uh, classified this, they very much defined it as a burnout when it comes to work. Um, but but we recognize that work means so much more, especially when you're an activist and you're dedicated to social change and social causes. Work is so much more than than your nine to five or your salary job. It's 
Um, it's everything that that you're doing when you're when you're thinking, your your passion for the cause, the the activism work you do behind the scenes, and all of that. Um, so when we looked at work uh, and burnout, we looked at it much more holistically. So uh, we view burnout kind of on a spectrum. And uh, when you come to kind of our workshops and our dialogues, so kind of our main main form of work, um, we do like awareness raising around what is burnout, what it looks like and feels like in, in our bodies and in ourselves. Um, we recognize that burnout as as a uh, issue is common, but it shows up differently for everyone. So we help folks identify what that looks like. Um, and a lot of the work we do is to catch ourselves before we get into kind of that red, that hot zone of burnout and what we can do to build tools, strategies before we get there. Great. Thank you, Leah. And I'm sure we'll hear much more from you. I'm going to kick off the discussion questions and we'll go around and let everyone answer them. Um, so the first question uh, for everyone is, you know, number one, how can we stay motivated and inspired while doing this really challenging work that is often very kind of systemic work tackling these, these massive issues, whether it's climate change or systemic racism or militarism, you know, these issues are not going to go away in one day. So how can we kind of stay motivated over time working on campaigns that, you know, potentially could last years or decades? Um, and I will just call on you in any kind of random order. So, uh, David, I'll start with you. Good to see all of you. I don't see all of you on one screen, but uh, I appreciate all the good work that I'm sure that everyone's doing. Um, I have written a book, by the way, called Waging Peace, uh, Global Adventures of a Lifelong Activist. Um, and uh, I have had the opportunity, I, the last 60 some years, I've been actively involved in peace and justice work. And uh, I've written this book to try to share some of the uh, stories uh, from my life that uh, have inspired me. And I, uh, at the end of the book, I have 10 lessons learned from my life of activism. Um, so I would encourage you to take a look at this if you want to feel inspired about uh, so many stories using uh, active nonviolence and being part of nonviolent movements to bring change. So um, in response to that question, I think uh, one, it's important to hold out a vision of the world that we want to create. Uh, we're not just fighting against this evil or that evil and the, the latest uh, horrible thing that Trump has said, et cetera. We're working for, I mean, for most of us in world beyond war, we're working for a world without war. And to keep that vision in our mind to empower us uh, and, and strengthen us that, uh, that this is possible and uh, to me, it's also very empowering to know that there are people all over the world uh, who are working toward that same goal. You know, we're not alone. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and the people have experienced, ha have discovered the power of, uh, of active nonviolence and of nonviolent movements. And uh, I mean, that's just, it's just so inspiring. Uh, I, perhaps some of you know uh, Rivera Sun's uh, website, Nonviolent News. Uh, but uh, she uh, lays out every week, <laughs> literally hundreds of uh, stories of, uh, of nonviolent successes in different parts of the world. A second, I think we need to uh, realize the oneness of all life and that we're really all one human family and we need to understand that deep in our own souls um, and, uh, and then act on that conviction. And to, to me, um, if, if you are in a family and your family is in a, or your child is in a burning house or anybody, anybody's child is in a burning house, uh, you will run in there to try to uh, save that person. And we think of the millions of people all over the world that are suffering from war uh, and injustice. Um, and th they're part of our human family. 
and that can inspire us. Um, I think that uh, that hope is a very important ingredient in uh, uh, in, in keeping us going. Uh, I I've led a number of groups to Russia. Uh, they've been one of our major quote enemies, <laughs> and we've been trying to just get to know the Russian people. But she said um, during our trip, and this was many years ago, she said, I'm an optimist because I can't afford to be a pessimist. And if we, uh, if we get a pes pessimistic about the possibility for change or overwhelmed by the, the evil and the wars and the violence we see around us, uh, we will be right where the power structure wants us to be. <laughs> and to feel powerless. And uh, so uh, I think hope is very critical. I think one of the things that governments do is to keep us afraid. Uh, and uh, afraid that if you step out of line uh, and, uh, and begin uh, speaking up against whatever the government uh, uh, thinks is right, uh, that that you'll get in trouble. Well, I think uh, with John Lewis, uh, what we need is good trouble. Um, and <laughs> that the government might not consider that good trouble. But anyway, I think we need to overcome our fear. And, and part of the way we can do that is uh, through community. And I think uh, it's, you know, we're in a pretty individualistic kind of society. And if we are trying to work on something as massive as ending war, just as a lone individual, uh, that could be pretty <laughs> discouraging. And uh, I think not only realizing that people all over the world that are also en engaged in that struggle, but uh, to build communities of people uh, wherever you live, wherever you are, uh, that are working on that together. Uh, and that can support each other. And when you get to this, the, the point where you're actually doing uh, nonviolent actions and building nonviolent movements, um, and the government comes down on you, uh, you can really be support each other for each other. So it's support for each other, both uh, on the kind of uh, the, the personal level, but also on the, uh, kind of spiritual, uh, personal level. So that's, that's a beginning. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. And you know, your kind of your statement about needing to create a vision to keep us motivated, of course, reminds me of World Beyond Wars book, which lays out our vision for the alternative global security system and starts out at the beginning of the book with one page of, you know, what kind of our ideal world would be beyond militarism. So that's something that we've tried to lay out in the book to kind of guide us forward in this work. Um, Raven, I will pass this question off to you. How do you stay motivated and inspired despite the challenge of our work? Hello, everyone. Raven Wings here in Takanto, Toronto. So thank you for having me. Um, I represent Black Lives Matter Toronto, but my perspective comes from my own lived experience as an Afro-Indigenous trans woman. Um, so I thought that's important to say before I answer. Um, so I think you have to allow yourself to feel. Uh, I think many times we resist our feelings and move with logic, right? Um, but it is always the things that sit in your own heart that you don't tire from, um, that you dedicate and commit yourself to, um, I would say, don't numb out. Get creative with the ways that you organize and um, and share information. Um, habit is much more consistent than inspiration. Um, so make your activism your habit and think of yourself as an ancestor. Like what do you yourself want to leave behind for the people who are coming after you? And so thinking of it that way, um, you will be tired, but un 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 motivation won't be your issue. 
Thank you, Raven. Uh, Liz. Kia ora, tato, namihi nui, kia koto. I'm Liz Rim as well from Aotearoa, New Zealand, and I recognise everybody here today, the land that you're standing on, from where it came, and the vision that we have for the future. Thank you for joining us today. And um, just also, Greta, you mentioned well, that we have our World Beyond War Peace Pledge, which sums up exactly uh, where we how we see what we're planning to do. Um, I think the essential thing is all about people, really. Um, knowing, knowing who we are and, and knowing what we're, what we're trying to do. And I acknowledge the, the two previous speakers because those things are so important about having a vision. Um, and I think also humour is really important and uh, not to take ourselves too seriously because I mean, for, us, for uh, those of us in World Beyond War, it's kind of a, you know, a ridiculous notion to stand up for world peace. It's what, you know, Miss Universe talks about. So, you know, we have to be, we don't want to be sort of kind of too earnest. Um, and to be able to um, take breaks and stop sometimes to feed ourselves and feed others, to ask for help, to say, to say yes when help is offered and to say, no, we can't do something if it's too much. It's, it's all about love and humanity. And I think if you're an activist, you're probably an activist for life. I've seen some 98 year old little old ladies doing artivism and they just do it every day as, as, um, Raven Wings mentioned it's it's it becomes a habit after a while. Um, it's also okay, you know, we're human. It's okay to make mistakes and to ask for forgiveness sometimes, or um, forgive others uh, when when things don't go so well, because um, this is really challenging stuff, especially at these times when the politics of the world, a crazy world, and also with COVID, which is putting many people all of us under tremendous stress already. But being with other people, working together with like-minded people is really, really a tonic. And um, I like to keep learning. There's a whole lot of things like nonviolent communication and creating um, communities of peace, alternatives to violence project, other groups. It's another way to, to build relationships, to learn, to be with other organizations which are similarly, like for example, the environment movement and the peace movement working together or Extinction Rebellion for Peace. And um, the creativity using art um, is really a wonderful thing to do and it engages people. So it's small steps, just standing up, you know, one day at a time. And I think just standing up is being a success, um, although success is better than failure. Thank you, Liz. Uh, Leah, and Leah, you could speak from your experience working with your clients or from your personal experience, whichever you prefer. Sure, thanks, Greta. And I, I think what, what I'll add here is just in addition to uh, what's already been echoed by the other panelists, but I think what's so important for, for the long haul, and especially as an activist being committed to the cause every day and often for life, it's uh, I think it's so important to surround yourself with people who love, support, and understand you at, at a soul level and that you'll keep each other uplifted. Um, and as David mentioned, we, we live in a very independent culture where we um, value and prioritize independence and individualism. But I think collectively to move towards interdependence helps us um, alleviate some of, some of that, that burnout culture as well. Um, and, and also like it's it's a marathon and not a sprint and we need to treat it for the long haul. Um, during our work and, and our work with our, our clients and, and activists and individuals, uh, we talk a lot about this concept of personal sustainability. Um, and it's about honoring what you need daily. Um, no matter what's happening out there in the world, we still deserve rest at the end of the day. Um, and self-compassion really is the key. Um, when I think when we're hard on ourselves, and especially when there's uh, there's so many problems and issues that seem so imminent and big out there right now, um, we can have a tendency to uh, also react really urgently inside. So I think 
as, as much as we can to try and keep whatever we can to, to keep ourselves grounded and have that calm center, but also to just practice a lot of self-compassion because um, there, there's a lot happening in the world out there. It's a lot for one person to handle. Thank you. Okay, transitioning to the next question, which is about self-care. And I'd love to hear what your recommendations are for self-care practices, things that you do um, to kind of step back and make sure that you're maintaining your own mental and physical health. And, you know, this is something that I struggle with as well, where, you know, I can get caught up in something and realize 12 hours later that I've been stuck at the computer all day, you know, and haven't got up. So I'd love to go around and hear your thoughts on this question. And I think we'll just go in the same order. So David? Um, one is just to spend some time in nature and you said to go out <laughs> away from your computer. But uh, I think nature is uh, really at peace with itself. And I find a lot of uh, peace just being in nature and nurture for my soul. Um, I think um, taking some time for uh, meditation or reflection on uh, what's really important in our lives and uh, really uh, allow yourself to uh, appreciate all the positive things that have already been, uh, that are already happening. Um, as, as, as I have mentioned, several have mentioned, I think the importance of uh, community where we can support and love one another. Um, I think, uh, I think actually if we are practicing what we preach, if we're not only kind of working for the beloved community <laughs> for a peace uh, in the in the world, but we can really be living that peace, living that nonviolence uh, in our own lives and how we relate to uh, the people around us and to uh, uh, the people that we're working with and even people in the opposition. Uh, uh, I think that is good, again, for our souls, <laughs> for our bodies, and our spirits. Um, so I think having a, uh, a, a support group, uh, whether it's your family or whether it's uh, people forming a support group of, I mean, ideally a chapter of uh, World Beyond War, uh, that are people that are working for this, this goal and but also support each other um, personally uh, and take time to be in nature together and take time to sing together. I didn't men mention singing, but I think in the freedom struggle in the, in the South, in the 60s in this country and the peace movement, uh, music has been something which has really um, uh, nourished all, all of our souls. And even when the police are out there uh, <laughs> ready to attack you, uh, you can sing songs. Uh, ain't, go ain't nobody going to turn us around, you know. And and, and that's not just uh, words. That that becomes uh, uh, some strength for your uh, inner soul. Thanks, David Raven. Sure. Thanks for the question. Um, I think adding self-care within your activism. So for me, self-care is about loving beyond myself. Um, and so, and if we understand that like justice is what love looks like in public, um, then, then we need to be like the weapons of mass construction, you know, the weapons of mass love. Um, and it, I feel like it's not enough to just change like the system itself. We have to change it within ourselves. Um, Self-reflection is really important. If I'm not creating um, forgiveness or love or abolition within myself and my own practices, I cannot ask anyone else to do it. I can't create it outside of myself, you know? Um, and so we have to protect, um, like David just said, we have to protect the land, the plants, the animals, um, the water, the climate, these are ways that we also take care of ourselves <laughs> um, by taking care of the things that are giving us life. Um, and as a movement storyteller myself and understanding performance as protest, 
um, my very being as a site of protest um, and utilizing my dance when I chant, when I dance in the street and choreographing these rallies and actions um, and protests um, that often um, allow me to expel and, and, and release the things that are, that are sort of pent up. You know, I love watching my Janet Jackson videos and, <laughs> you know, um, playing with makeup and all that kind of stuff too. So you have to diversify what it is that brings you joy. Um, but if you create that space within what you're actually doing, it won't feel like you're waiting for like one week out of the year for vacation. Like it, it, it's, it's woven into what you're actually already creating. Um, that's why I like to move from, from something that I'm interested in as opposed to trying to develop a whole other kind of skill. Thanks. And I'm seeing a lot of questions coming in in the chat. So this is great. We will have lots of time to answer those and do continue to put questions in the chat for our speakers. Um, next, Liz. Yep, thank you. So this is a, a, great, a great question about how, how we look after ourselves. And um, I resonate with the others and especially the idea that we are connected and I mean, what we're, what we're trying to achieve in the world is also what we're trying to be in the world. So in the peace movement, it's, you know, we're making a stand for peace. So we kind of need to be peaceful and um, in ourselves. And that's another challenge, peaceful in our relationships. And um, often, you know, one gets challenged about those kind of things, like what about this and what do you do about this? So resilience is really important as well. Um, the connections with um, family and friends and the people who nurture us and who we nurture um, is important to keep. It's very easy to get unbalanced when we're working on particular things, but and it's okay to be unbalanced sometimes if we balance up again. As I mentioned earlier, taking breaks regularly. Um, I love those other ideas about um, dancing and nature and music and singing they're very very powerful and have been around for such a long time so it's it's, it's you know it's important to keep moving as well as um, sitting in front of the computer um, and another aspect is um, uh, nurturing our spiritual selves so uh, maybe um, having some kind of spiritual community as well woven in is, 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 is very good and that's on top of the, um, well, I think nurturing groups is a part of it. And um, I've been in groups where one wonderful little old lady would, every time we met, she would bring a huge platter of sandwiches and just feed us. You know, we were so busy and we were sort of always making time to sort of eat and have that cup of tea and um, actually just take a wee break and just talk to each other and, and, and know each other. So um, that's... That's just some of my ideas anyway. Thank you, Liz. Um, Leah, and Leah, I don't know if you want to address this or if any other of the speakers want to address this, but I've also seen, you know, speaking about self-care, I've seen some kind of distinctions between self-care, community care, structural care, and self-soothing. Um, so I don't know if, if you want to speak on kind of those different definitions and what that means. Mm-hmm. Um... Yeah, I'll, I'll try to touch on it as I share. Um, I, I was reflecting on what Raven shared and it really resonated that you you really can't put out there what you don't have in here. Um, and I, I think that that applies a lot to self-care and, and self-compassion as well. Um, if we have a lot of compassion and drive for the issue out there, if, if that's not full inside ourselves, that can't last long term outside either. Um, and I think in terms of self-care, the, the biggest thing that's made the difference for me over the last little while is um, viewing my, my life and, and I guess in a way my calendar because I, I sort of run my life through my calendar um, and viewing in terms of energy and rather than time. Um, often we, we look at uh, like the, the blank space that we have in our calendar and we see, oh, I have a free hour here, a free uh, 30 minutes there and we've slot in a bunch of things. 
Um, but if we're aware of what, what gives us energy and what takes us energy and we plan our time accordingly, that becomes much more rejuvenating. Um, so if I were to give an example, let's say I um, am planning a really big group event. Uh, I'm planning a rally or something. And um, technically it only takes one hour, that rally. But I'm an introvert and very sensitive and that's going to take a lot out of me. And so realistically, even though the rally is one hour, it's going to take me out for the entire day. And so to plan my day out like that. And um, so that's been a really good uh, um, kind of practice for, for my self-care um, and taking restorative breaks. Um, I think I kind of micro moments throughout the day, like making sure that you take a walk uh, whenever you have lunch or that you can take like a five minute screen break from doing uh, doing work during the day and and to taking vacations. I think that's really, really important as well. And to do just something grounding and nourishing for yourself um, every day. Um, one uh, self-care habit that uh, has made such a big difference for me is to put my phone on airplane mode. And um, so I put my phone on airplane mode um, around half an hour before I go to sleep and half an hour after I wake up. And that time is meant for me to wind down and not think about work and do a meditation and make my coffee, that kind of thing. And so uh, really protecting your energy and your time has been, has been really beneficial. Um, on the piece around kind of self-care and community care and structural care, um, I think the, the piece to highlight there is uh, at the end, I think we're talking a lot about how we can take care of ourselves as individuals, but at the end of the day, I think it's really important to recognize that uh, something like burnout and something like like care, it's it's systemic. And we're when we're talking about burnout, it's, there's only so much that we can really do ourselves as well. Um, when we live in cultures that perpetuate uh, like burnout and productivity and and capitalism and all of that, so I think it's really important to acknowledge that. We are really just only one piece of this huge, huge, huge puzzle. And there's um, like community aspects to it uh, where, where we care for each other and, and have those kinds of uh, things built in. Um, and I think that the more longer term change that we're, that we're seeking for, that we're not quite there yet um, in terms of having structural care, like, like child care and social policy and, and all of these things. And these things are critical, but they are missing pieces right now. So I think it's, it's important to recognize that we can only do so much to, to do for ourselves. Thanks. Okay, I have one more question for all the panelists and then we will open up to audience Q&A. Um, so my last question is how to stay organized. Um, you know, and I get this question from our volunteers and our chapter coordinators who are, you know, reaching out to me and saying, oh my gosh, I'm getting hundreds of emails. You know, do you have any kind of practical strategies uh, or tips for how you can stay organized? Um, you know, specific tools that you might use or planning platforms. Um, anyway, David, we'll start with you to talk about how you can stay organized. I, th I think a part of the uh, problem, I think we're overwhelmed with information and overwhelmed with, uh, with critical issues that need our attention. And um, I think we need to uh, focus and prioritize and decide, here's the issue, here's the campaign that I'm really going to focus my energy on. And uh, I'm grateful that there's uh, thousands, millions, maybe millions of other people that can work on these other causes and we can support each other, but we don't all need to do everything. Because if, if we try to uh, do everything, uh, we will end up not being effective and we'll probably burn out. Um, and if we look at, uh, at at history, look at the the women's suffrage movement, look at the labor movement, look at the fight for an eight hour day, look at the uh, civil rights movement, the voting rights, et cetera. I, I mean, people were focused on, on an issue a part of the larger vision that they wanted to, a place they wanted to go in society and saying, we're gonna, we're gonna strike, we're gonna fast, we're going to uh, go to jail. Uh, we're, we're gonna be focusing on this issue. And you know maybe it'll take a month, maybe it'll take a year, maybe it'll take five years, maybe it'll take 20 years. But, but it's that, at focusing on an issue, a campaign, um, 
and realizing that it's take it's going to take sustained struggle and it's going to need more than just sitting behind our computer i think we need to realize that and i've kind of joked that sometimes i think that when the re revolution comes uh many of us will be sitting behind our computer uh just looking at all wow what look what's happening out there rather than really uh, playing an active role in helping uh, make change happen. Um, I, I think, I think um, one of the, well, two things that I do. Uh, one is each evening before I go to bed, I kind of think in terms of what is most important that I might, that I want to be doing tomorrow. And just take a, make a list of those five things, 10 things. Uh, so the other 25 things that you know may come in my mailbox or, or 100 things I don't need to get sidetracked by. Um, a second is there's so much good information uh, and things that I can't, I, I, realistically, I probably, uh, I, I know I can't get through everything if I'm going to uh, be fo working on this focused campaign that I want to be, that I am working on is I just make a list uh, in a little book uh, about uh, articles that are certainly look important and I'm interested in, but I'll come back to if I have time. And most of those I never come back to, <laughs> but at least they're there in the book. And if I need to go back at some point and say, well, what, what was that campaign? Or Chris Hedges wrote this article, whatever. Um, I, I can do that, but uh, if, if I mean, we can very easily, as I think everybody knows, just spend our whole lives, the rest of our lives, uh, looking at, at important e emails and emails that aren't so important. And so, uh, focus is really important. And finally, uh, I'd just like to add, I think we need to be inspired by uh, nonviolent movements and nonviolent struggles that have gone before us. And I hopefully that most people know this uh, DVD called A Force More Powerful, which is six major nonviolent movements for change on, in, in history. Um, and with Gandhi and King and the uh, sit-in movement, et cetera. And, and overthrowing dictators. Uh, we need to learn from those struggles and be inspired and realize we can do this too if we don't spend our whole lives in front of the computer uh, trying to get educated about all the stuff that's happening all over the world. <laughs> Thanks, David. Raven. Sure, so a um, couple of things. Um, when I was thinking about this question, it made me think about productivity right away. Um, and so if we reprioritize what we are, um, putting out as, as important in our week, um, uh, then I think that can shift. Um, like, cause I feel like if COVID-19 has, you know, taught me anything is that productivity isn't what defines like dedication and or worth or value. Um, I think that sometimes um, we live in a society that, that rewards burnout, that rewards the battle scars, that rewards, you know, um, behavior that, that essentially is um, mentally destabilizing. Um, and, and we call that healthy. And so those of us who don't feel like we can um, attain that level of productivity feel like we're falling behind, <laughs> but we're, it's not a race. As, um, as Leah said, it is um, a marathon, right? Even when you have tasks that you have to do, I think that if we center disability justice in our movement and recognize that we all have to move and, and create in vastly different ways, and we let go of, of these, these the centering of goals and more so the centering of the people who you are working with, I think it really shifts what you're able to do together. 
Um, and, 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 and I think that that leads to a release of the burnout. I think if you're all sharing it, if everyone's putting in um, and, and doing their part, it doesn't, it's not so heavy to, to lift, you know? Um, and, and, and like, as I said a little bit earlier, like not waiting for the two weeks out of the year for, for the vacation for you to <laughs> actually, and it doesn't often feel like a break. Actually, it's like your body like shuts down because you've been holding back or you haven't been um, paying attention to it. Um, and so in my, my calendar, I, I have my breaks I have my eat schedule, I have my friend hangouts, I have my work schedule, all of it is in there. So I see what my week looks like. Um, and then I ask myself, is this the week that I wanna have? Is, is this the kind of experience that I wanna have this week? Because I think that often when we're fighting for liberation, when we're fighting for our lives in many cases, um, it can be hard to feel like you can take a rest. It feels like a privilege. Right? We haven't really talked about privilege, but um, there is a kind of privilege, and for me, necessarily not having kids who I have to make sure um, are entertained all day, right? And so that, that's a different level of, of energy output that goes into like raising a family to then being at a nine to five to then being a 24 hour activist. <laughs> you know, well then trying to survive in a, in a capitalist system, you know, um, when, in, when in fact, what, we're, what in order to have an end to wars, it's actually, all of it has to come down. Like even the parts of um, capitalism that we enjoy, you know, all, all of it has to, we have to reckon with all of, all of the parts of ourselves that have allowed these systems to take place because of our own comfort. Um, you know, and, and just and just um, prioritizing yourself, prioritizing your, your needs. Um, there's no way that I can myself be fighting for Black liberation if I am not also going after my dreams and my goals. If I'm also not spending time with my family. Um, these things are important. And some folks may be disappointed, but I think if we let go of productivity and ourselves, then we'll let it go in each other. I think we ask too much of each other sometimes. Um, and so often that's it too. Um, just not lowering expectations, but having realistic understandings of what people are actually dealing with. Thank you. Liz? Okay, good stuff. Um, yeah, well, I've got the, um, I've got my phone with all my what I need to do, scheduled in a, either during the appointment time or just what I need to do. And I also, and I usually don't get through everything and have to move them to the next day, some of the things that I want to do. Um, and I also have a, um, a, because a, I'm a fashioned, a, a paper diary as well, and I can fill in the whole week and just to try and get an idea of what the whole week looks like, because it's hard to see what the whole week looks like on the phone um as far as the the emails goes that's a, a really big challenge and i think we all get too many emails um and it is hard to keep a track of them um i probably um i probably tend to prioritize getting on to those um first thing in the morning probably really quite early, sometimes 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. and um, my sleep hygiene is not brilliant. Um, so I sometimes do the emails in, in bed, as which I know is not a good good practice, but um, to be in front of the get up and go to the desk. Um, but sometimes it's really good just to get rid of, you know, reply to a whole lot of emails and it's done. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, I think we have points about focusing and as well as there being a tipping point, sometimes change can happen when, when you least ex expect it. And uh, bearing in mind the, the numbers that you need for a tipping point can be low as 3.5% as Erica Chenna, Dr. Erica Chenoweth has mentioned to, to create change. So um, yeah, I guess that's, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, so I'd love to keep learning. 
Thanks, Liz. Leah? And also a reminder to everyone to continue to use the chat box to put your questions for the speakers. Um, so if you don't know where the chat box is, it's usually on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Just hit the chat button and then you'll see that you can type in a question there. Leah? Cool. Thanks. Um, I think in terms of how to stay organized, I'd like to talk specifically through the lens of digital burnout. It's a topic that's come up a lot, especially during COVID, and we've been uh, offering workshops and different offerings around that. Um, and I think at the end of the day, our attention is everything, and we need to protect it accordingly. Um, it's well documented and well researched that technology is designed to psychologically manipulate and to take our attention. It's, it's literally designed that way. So no matter how much personal constraint or principles or whatever we have, like our, the technology is kind of built against us. Um, so what, what's been really helpful is to get rid of any like notification or, or a thing or even if Instagram's not serving you and you're finding yourself on Instagram like three hours a day and not, not learning very much and just feeling demoralized because of it, maybe, maybe delete it. Like maybe take some time away from it. Um, and, and, and maybe that's Instagram for some people, maybe that, that's Twitter for others, et cetera. Um, but to get rid of any notifications, that's not necessary. Um, and to, to be aware that different kind of social platforms and technology platforms out there are built to grab our attention. Um, even the colors that are used, uh, you'll notice that um, there's bright blues, bright reds, uh, bright purples. They're, they're literally built to, to grab our attention. So just to keep that in mind. Um, and lastly, I think uh, sometimes it's important to kind of check ourselves and, and really ask ourselves, do we really need to stay more organized? Or is it that we need, um, maybe instead of needing more tools to be productive, we actually need to do less and take time to do less and, and take space uh, to to. Uh, just relax or to, to rejuvenate and recover. And so I think it's important to check ourselves. Do we need to be more organized or is that actually we need to create more space in our own lives? Thanks, Leah. All right. So we're now going to open up to the audience questions and a lot has been coming through this chat box. So hopefully we can get to it all. Um, the first thing I'm seeing here is a question from Al Mitty, our chapter coordinator in Central Florida in the US. And he says, you know, what kind of what happens when those around us, like our family, our friends, our loved ones, don't share the same, you know, beliefs as us and are like either totally disinterested in the causes that we're working on or even maybe antagonistic to the causes that we're working on or just working on, you know, differing causes and we don't really have people close to us. Um, that are supporting the same issues. Have any of you been in that situation and kind of what are different strategies to cope with that. Any of the panelists can chime in. Um, I'm, I'm happy to jump in here. I think, thanks for your question. Um, I, I think the, the question I would ask myself is what is my personal capacity for it? And if you have personal capacity to, to inquire and, and to engage, um, then, then do so. But if, if it serves your mental health and, and I think how we take care of ourselves is very uh, reflective of, of the rest of our communities and our surroundings, et cetera. Um, if we have the personal capacity to deal with it, then, uh, then do so. But I think it's important to prioritize your mental health and, and check kind of where, where you're at first before, um, before engaging. I can jump in too. I think, um, you know, conversation is, 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 is something that can help um, allow your, your friends and family members to understand that they're involved, whether they are active or not. Um, and so, you know, even if you are a selfish person, if you are eating food from the grocery store, then you are supporting the farming industry. So then agriculture and climate change are your issue. Um, so if you, if, you, if you bring people in to understanding at their very own sort of personal experience, how your passions relate to their lives, often you can get um, more interest and, and, and more response. Um, but don't wait for other folks to, to catch on before you do it yourself. Sometimes you have to be the first. Sometimes you, you have to be the game changer in the family, um, the person who encourages folks to interrogate um, 
what they thought was okay, what they didn't think was okay. Um, and those are all very important dialogues. So um, uh, don't get discouraged by, by folks who, who disagree. I think that's important to have folks who are around you have varying um, opinions and, un and understandings that help sharpen your tools to, to, for you to understand how you really feel, what you really understand and what are the parts that you can clarify um, for folks um, what they might be misunderstanding about your movement or your understandings. I'd like to add too that I think it's um, it's great to include family and friends. In fact, um, I was at a friend's birthday lunch once and we started talking about the local park that the council would decide to put a shopping mall on. And so we then and there um, decided to do th something about it. We made submissions and it was just a group of friends um, and it grew into quite, quite a strong and powerful um, some actions that we took out of that. So, um, and also my kids like, you know, I've always taken my kids to protests and actions and so on. They, they've grown up with that. Um, and now they're kind of, they're, they're grown up and they're sort of activists in their own right. They, they, that's just the way they see life is, is to, you know, you, do you take action around it? So it's, it's a little bit contagious. I mean, I guess I would uh, just say, I think that uh, we uh, we need to invite uh, our friends or family members that aren't necessarily a part of the, the movement to uh, participate in, in things where they could even play a small role and or feel inspired. I mean, if there's a, a somebody that's going to be speaking or a, a video or a film uh, that could help them understand, you know, what's really moving you deep in your soul. Um, and uh, the other is, I would say, I think it's even more important if, if your immediate family is not very supportive of what you're doing to develop that kind of mutual support with the people that do share that are part of your support group or your affinity group or a uh, local chapter or whatever it is, where you're supporting each other on a personal level and are become friends. Uh, that is a very important, I mean, we all need that kind of uh, really uh, emotional, psychological, uh, personal support uh, to keep going in the struggle. So build that support, you know, in your local, in your, and build, build a support community uh, of people that really do uh, share your deep concerns and values a and live, as, as we mentioned earlier, live the revolution. If, if people uh, see the joy and the love <laughs> uh, and the caring uh, in your own life, they'll be more inspired to join you um, in, uh, getting on the in the front lines to to work on on whatever issue you're working on thanks david um, the next question from grant asks about figuring out your calling or your discernment um, and especially thinking about you know the fact that there are so many different issues that we're struggling with worldwide you might be working on one issue let's say militarism which is a kind of a long-term campaign and then something much more pressing might come up on the local level and kind of not knowing of you know, what to prioritize um, and sort of what your discernment process is. Um, so I guess uh, wondering if, if the speakers could talk about that. Yeah, I can jump in on that one. Um, I think it's helpful to identify um, your actual interest. If it, if it involves something that you, you are passionate about, then, then that's where you go into understanding that all of the, all of the ways of liberation, all of the ways of, of, of freedom, of, of change, of rest, of preventing burnout are, are part of the same goal. They're all part of the same system where like you, if you're working in one area, it's like working at a, in a different part of the body. Like you're working on the foot, but it affects the back. 
you know, there are, um, and, and allowing yourself to understand that it is a network of people who are, who are working and, and who are actively working to shift um, things. And so um, you don't need to necessarily be at the helm of every single one. You can be supporting in this area, supporting in that area. I think that that's um, the ways that I've done it because I'm not just black, I'm also in, I like indigenous and I'm also trans. And so those are all things that I'm really passionate about. Um, and all and all areas that I that I find my activism, but I found a way to weave it all together within the Black Lives Matter Toronto movement um, and global movement. So um, and that's why I feel like what I'm doing in my small area is 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 affecting the change outside of it. I, I, I'm a, uh, a Quaker and uh, Quakers have what we call clearness committees. Uh, and uh, what they are, and you don't have to be a Quaker, <laughs> you don't have to call it a clearness committee. But if a person feels uh, I have a, a leading, I mean, uh, right now, I, one of my leadings is uh, uh, I've, been re I've been spending some time with Daniel Ellsberg and uh, he, he's, he's pointing out that, uh, that uh, if we have a nuclear war, it, it could really mean the end of uh, human life uh, as we know it on our planet. Over 7 billion people could die. Um, and <laughs> so uh, anyway, I, I, it seems somebody needs, to, we need to address that in a much more powerful way. Well, if I'm feeling that leading, a, a, a group of, of friends or, or colleagues can sit down with me and say, well, David, uh, here's the uh, five other things that you're working on. <laughs> uh, is this something uh, that, I mean, is that really coming from the middle of your soul or is that just kind of, a, oh, that would be a good idea? Um, and do you have some other people that you could work on this? with um, and uh, you know, raising tough questions that I would need to consider. And we just need, I think if each of us has a group of, of friends or coworkers that if we are feeling here is something that I might wanna spend major time with over the coming weeks, months, even years uh, to get, so it's, you're not just making that decision on your, on your own, you are making that, uh, with the support of a, a caring, loving community. And uh, that can be very, very helpful. Any other comments on this question? All right, I'll move on to the next question then. Um, so question from Meg is, how do you make activist friends? I think this is a fun question, kind of, you know, talking about moving beyond being so focused on, you know, when's the next meeting, when's the next rally and kind of moving beyond that to become friends and to talk about, you know, how's your personal health? How's your mental health? How are you doing? You know, checking in, um, you know, and not just being so focused on the next event. I think, again, you can incorporate it into the way that you organize. Um, for me, I'm, I'm lucky to have a team of folks with Black Lives Matter Toronto where um, we, we, we don't just organize actions and rallies to talk about anti-Black racism. We also create productions together. We also support each other's um, you know, artistic projects. Um, we also hang out sometimes and it isn't a work day. Um, make make it very specific that it isn't a work day, or even if it is, it's a mixture of, of hanging out, of work, uh, of play, so that there is flexibility in the actual um, creating of the relationship. Um, I, I believe that's what's worked best um, for me, um, allowing um, relationships to develop organically by, by giving yourself um, uh, opportunities to, for that to happen. 
Yeah, I mentioned earlier about um, June who would make sandwiches for one of the groups that I was in, a very, very successful, happy group. And um, so I guess as well as all the organizing and the work, it's, it's creating a time and a space, um, you know, during meetings, for example, to, to be able to have some social time and then kind of go from there, really. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, I think sometimes having a time before a meeting just to check in with each other. How, how is each person doing and, you know, what, what's what's happening in their lives? So you have a sense of them more as a whole person rather than this, they're just <laughs> working on it anymore. Um, and, and then uh, I think organically, how can you actually support each other as whole human beings is important. I mean, earlier today, I just spent some time uh, with some friends uh, and, and co-workers. Uh, we went to a beautiful place and took our guitars and were uh, singing uh, some songs, uh, movement songs, but uh, it, was, it was really fun. So uh, finding things that uh, you can do together um, other than just, uh, you know, having meetings uh, that can be nourishing for all of you and, and building community. And um, I'll, I'll just add one last point to that. And I think it's to, to view each other holistically, the design spaces uh, for organizing and convening holistically as well. Um, I think if if we do, if you do have the power, um, the power and privilege to be a facilitator and, or an organizer of a space to design it in a way that uh, people are known as, as people first rather than as organizers first. Okay, next question is from Meredith who asks, have you ever seen a permanent burnout? Uh, is that possible? And how can we spot it early on before that happens? Um, I'm happy to jump in on this one. Um, I, I don't think it's physically possible to be in permanent burnout. Um, I think uh, just the, the nature of burnout is once you're there and once you're in that like really deep red zone, it, it becomes very difficult to, to do anything. Um, and and it's, it's very advised that you get kind of medical uh, help or kind of uh, the help of a, a mental health professional that when it comes to that stage. So um, I think uh, technically speaking, it's it's not possible to be in a permanent state of burnout. However, um, I think it is possible to to kind of work through cycles of burnout or being kind of low grade burnout, where maybe you're not at that kind of, kind of hot red zone of burnout where it's impossible to do anything, but kind of feeling a constant sense of brain fog or tiredness or lack of energy. Um, or just not being your whole kind of energetic self that you usually are, and um, that is possible. And uh, one thing that we found uh, helps and one thing that we uh, coach the people that we work with to do is to identify the, the cues and symptoms that show up for you. And um, so if I, I know for me personally, when I'm kind of getting close to burnout, I get really bad at replying to messages and I'm replying to kind of communications or texts or WhatsApp or whatever it is. Um, even though I value my friendships and relationships very much, it's just one of the first things that falls through the cracks. So starting to notice, note, notice and note down what are the cues and symptoms that, that lead you closer to that red zone. Uh, that's kind of a helpful way to look at it. I'd like to chip in, Greta, um, about burnout. Burn and um, uh, before I was so involved in World Beyond War, I was in politics for six years um, on our provincial council, which was about looking after the environment. Um, and I was very much a minority and advocating for issues like sustainability and climate change, anti-fracking, that kind of thing. And um, I wasn't very strategic about what I did. Um, and at the end of, and also there was some uh, family health problems. My, my sister was dying and died during that time. And, and about um, after about five and a half years, I happened to 
be at the doctor and he said, oh, you've, you've got four symptoms of burnout. If you don't stop now, you'll, you'll get really sick. And you know you, should, you need to get out of <clears throat> you need to get out of politics. So, um, so that was quite an alarming um, wake up call for me. And uh, we were actually coming up to an election, and I'd already decided not to restand, partly because um, partly because of my sister. It was so difficult, and my, losing my sister, I thought, well, if I had a year to live, would I be doing this fighting? I was literally fighting with my colleagues every single meeting. Um, so, so I just um, finished the term and had a, quite a long break, and then I became involved in the peace movement. So, um, you know, I guess I've learned from that um, because uh, your burnout is burnout is not fun, and I think it makes us less effective as well. Um, and and the the, more, the worse it cut, the you know, the sicker we become, the harder it is to recover. Yeah, can I add just a little one more thing? Um, I think um, some advice that was given to me by former Black Panthers was that you have to be honest with yourself about um, this one question. Have I done everything that I can do for this particular um, job or moment or movement? Um, I think it's okay to shift the way that you organize. Right now, I'm a frontline activist but in two years, I might shift to a different way of organizing because of the, the amount of trauma that I receive from being on the front lines of, of a movement. And so, um, you know, maybe sitting on an advisory board, maybe moving into an elders council, like different things are, are can can be uh, sort of designed um, to to help prevent that. And like a constant check in with yourself around, you know. Do I have enough breaks within my organizing? Do I have enough time to to um, allow an impact to really like shift within myself? Sometimes we're we're hit with trauma, we don't deal with it, and then it becomes other pieces and, and different things because we're so busy with with the work. Um, um, but if you are you like I in indigenous practices, it's like you you breathe, you take four breaths. And the first breath is for yourself. The second breath is for the people who you are organizing with and are around. The third breath is for your ancestors and the ones who came before you. And the fourth breath is for the ones who come after you. You know, but the first is for yourself. It's almost like the, the airplane roll when the plane is going down, you put it on yourself first. Um, to, to just to make sure that you are always centering, like, how am I doing? How am I doing? Did, did I check in with myself today? Did I have water? Did I bring that extra vegetable, that extra, um, that extra fruit juice, that extra whatever that thing is that makes you feel like um, you can continue um, and, and be careful of, 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 of leaning into vices um, to, to release, um, you know, because you, you can, you can come, become addicted to trauma. <laughs> you can become addicted to a kind of um, burnout too. Um, and so um, just, I guess, constant reflection. And, and, and when you have great people around you, um, they can help you stay accountable to your health and to your organizing as well. Um, I think these, these things are really helpful for me right now. I think that um, it's, it's okay to take some time out. I mean, I don't think there's such a thing as permanent. <laughs> I hope there's not such a thing as permanent uh, burnout. But um, I think uh, just taking some time to rejuvenate uh, and do things that really uh, lighten your, your spirit and, and help renew hope. Because I, I think burnout comes partly from hopelessness. And uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, Sojourners put out a book called, uh, I think it was, what's it called? Uh, oh, I'm not forgetting. Um, but but it's, it's just many people who've been actively involved in the movement and just uh, hearing those stories has been very inspiring. I have a friend that just spent a couple of years in prison uh, for a nonviolent action. And he's going to walk uh, 1,500 miles on the Pacific Crest Trail from Mexico to Canada. 
uh, or uh, there's another friend that does laughter yoga uh, every day. Uh, ben Spock, I encourage people to just look at films that were uh, helped you, encourage you to laugh. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's ways to heal and uh, just feeling inspired by uh, many of the positive things that are, as I said earlier, of, of movements and struggles around the world uh, that can uh, give us courage. And um, I, I encourage you to, to look at that nonviolent news uh, from uh, Rivera Sun. <laughs> Each week you can get re-inspired by uh, all the positive things that are happening around the world. Thanks, David. And uh, just a time check, we have about 15, 20 minutes left. So there's still time to put your questions and comments in the chat. So do continue to utilize that. Um, another question, this is an interesting question, is about trust and being vulnerable and, you know, sort of making a space to be trustworthy of your colleagues and your fellow organizers and to kind of be vulnerable around them and to let them care for you and maybe take over for you if you need uh, some assistance. And so um, the Al who asked this question asks the panelists if you could share a time maybe when you experienced something like this. Um, I, I can share a, a time that I learned through a mistake, and the mistake was not being vulnerable. Um, I, this was kind of early on in my, my organizing activism career when I was working on uh, one of my very first election campaigns. And um, I, I was very high achieving, wanted to do everything all the time, and, um, and thankfully, I, I did kind of deliver on everything as well. So as far as the front that I was putting out there to my team and the people I was working with was, I can do everything plus more. But inside, that's not actually the case. And I was getting very few hours of sleep. I wasn't taking care of myself. I wasn't nourishing myself. And so I, I hit a breaking point one day. Um, and that was kind of my big moment of vulnerability in that campaign when when. Uh, I, I think it was something if I was asked to take on um, some work that wasn't mine. And my immediate answer was, yes, of course, I can do it. Um, and just something didn't feel right. And, and I love what Reuben said about just constantly check in with yourself. Uh, and if I could offer my, my younger self back then advice is like check in with yourself. What was that feeling that came to you in that very moment? And it was I had no capacity, no way that I was able to do that. And so I uh, learned through this mistake of, of kind of putting out this front of I can do everything all the time uh, when actually I, I couldn't. Um, and so I, I broke down, I sobbed at the, at the campaign office and that was like a real kind of moment of truth for me that here's what I'm really capable of. And, um, and I, I actually, I shouldn't be sacrificing my, my health, uh, whether mental or physical or anything in order to do this. So um, I think kind of the moral of the story is it's so important to bring kind of your true and honest and authentic self. And, um, and I think it's also important to acknowledge that everyone's needs aren't going to look the same. Um, you know, I, I need a full eight hours of sleep every night, but I know some people are fine with six or seven. And so uh, it, there's no need to compare kind of whose needs are, are better or worse than others, like your needs are your needs and, and make them known and honor them. Yes, I absolutely agree with everything you just said and appreciate it. Um, you know, I think often when we're afraid of, of, of being vulnerable, that's what it is, a fear response, like a trauma response. Um, we know them as um, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, you know? And, and so to ask yourself, what part of myself is actually responding in this moment? Um, am I responding from a fear place? Am I responding from a defensive place? Am I responding from a place of, um, you, you, you know, there are so many different levels of, of, of places to respond to or reasons to uh, not be vulnerable in this space. I think, um, listen to your instincts. Sometimes it, 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 it isn't possible for you to be vulnerable in a space. And sometimes it is, and you have to read the room 
<laughs> so to speak. Um, I'm saying this because it, it's not safe for me in many, many places. And so I have to be aware of what is happening um, all the time. That's just a part of my life now. Um, but I do have places where I can rest my head. I do have people who are looking out for me um, that allow me to show up as, as myself. Um, a practice that I do for myself that helps me to do that is um, I have a mirror practice where I stare at myself in the mirror for 30 minutes a day. Um, and just taking in the side of my own features, the side of my own face so I get a so I get an understanding of like what is looking back at me what am I giving out what it what is coming back to me um and, and, and it's and it's a it's a love uh, meditation routine that I do um that, that helps me um just fall in love with myself so that so because if you love yourself fully then you don't need someone else to, to validate who you are um, but when they do, you feel it even more. You're able to accept it and 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 receive it. Um, and so that's what I feel like has helped me to be myself in all the spaces that that I sh I show up in. Um, there's a level of confidence and there's a level of trust that that you offer to people um, who you've never met or who maybe you've, you've known in different ways. I think uh, trust and vulnerability is really important, um, as the others have said, to be aware of how of how we're sitting in a group. And sometimes, sadly, it might be in a group that it's just not working. The relationships aren't working, or there's some, you know, some dominant personalities, and and you know, one is constantly struggling. And um, sometimes it's better just to move on and leave to get out of that environment and put your energy into something else into a, into um, a, an organization where you can actually function fully and the other thing is and it can be very hard to do that especially if, if you put your heart and soul into something but sometimes I think that's really healthy to know that and the other thing is that um, trusting the other members um, I've been involved with uh, organizing few events lately um, and then through making the dates for these events with colleagues it's been very hard to find a date that suited everybody and so some of the events have been on dates where I can't get there and I, I had to deal with um, my feelings of disappointment and frustration and, and so on because I want to be there but just and just realize actually this is okay I don't need to be there I don't need to be everything they'll be fine it's going to be fine Liz honestly just get over yourself and um, be happy that things can happen <laughs> it's not you know the, the movement is bigger than than ourselves yeah such an important lesson of the need to delegate uh, David do you want to say anything on this question well, I was just going to give it as an example. Um, I was invited to go to Christchurch, New Zealand uh, some years ago and uh, by people I'd, I'd never met. But I said, is there anybody there that uh, likes to go uh, cl climbing or trekking in the mountains? And they said, oh, yeah, we have uh, one of our members that really every weekend he's in the mountains. So I went uh, a week earlier. And uh, we went trekking in the mountains, tramping, they call it. And uh, those, those folks have become friends. And, um, you know, I've gone back uh, another time <laughs> to, to go in, in the mountains with them. And I, I, I think the relationship became something totally different than just uh, going and speaking at a meeting and then leaving and you know, going to the next place, et cetera. And I think to the extent that we can uh, build really those kind of uh, friendly, personal relationships, doing something that we really, that nourishes our body and soul, as well as uh, having an opportunity to talk much more in depth about things that we care about uh, in our work for ending war, et cetera. Uh, I think, it, it's those kind of 
our relationships can help us prevent burnout and give us the uh, nourishment and strength to keep doing the, the important work that we need to do. Greta, I just wonder if I could give a shout out to one of um, our other board members who will be on, will on this call, who's a very experienced activist, um, Alice Slater. And she's also been involved with the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. Um, she's made some comments in the chat, but um, I don't know if um, Alice would like to, or was able to make some comments as well here. You're muted. Yeah, I will have Alice. to mute her, um, Alice. Well, that's okay, but I wasn't a speaker. I didn't know there were panelists here. You know, I, I didn't realize that was the uh, format that people were chosen to be speaking. So I just think it's a great conversation. I, I think we're in an incredible moment right now. There's no time for burnout. I mean, who can be burned out? I mean, we're living in the pandemic. I mean, we're we, we have to rewire, rewire our whole lives, even if we can do anything, you know, and as far as being on the computer too much, that's all we are. We're all talking to each other on a computer. We can't even meet in person anymore. So, uh, you know, everything's on hold. And what's great is that the young people are on the march, at least in the home of Caligula of the empire right here, they're on the march. And they're, like they're marching every night past my house because I live near uh, the mayor's house in New York City. And it's young people and it's white people and black people and brown people, I mean, and gay and straight. It's like an incredible assembly and very respectful and, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter, but it's much more than that. It's like everybody's, you know, like life matters. They're just uh, incredible. So. I'm optimistic. I always am optimistic. I mean, I've had so many victories in my 82 years. You know, every time we have a victory, we go backwards, but we stop nuclear testing. You know, we got this new ban treaty. We won the Nobel Peace Prize that said nuclear weapons are illegal. That was like a 10-year campaign. We just came off. So that's what keeps me going, you know, victory. And the idea that uh, there's people coming in behind us to make it happen. So. Thank you, Alice. Thanks for joining us. And Alice is one of World Beyond War's board members and has been with us from basically the beginning when World Beyond War was founded in 2014. Um, okay, I think we have time for one more question, which is from Gretchen. Gretchen asks about, um, can you speak to dealing with burnout for people who have different levels of ability? Um, for example, if you have maybe a cognitive disability, you can't just set your priorities or make a plan for dealing with burnout. Or if you have uh, sensitivity to um, loud sounds, you might not be able to just listen to music. That's not relaxing to you. Um, so could the panelists kind of speak to, to this issue? Um, sure. I mean, th th that's why I said the check-in is, is, is with yourself. It, 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 is, it is the only person who knows your body as good as you is, is you. <laughs> like, I, I, I know what works for my body and, and, for, and for my, my spirit, um, but, it, but, it, but it comes from you. Some people look to meditation. Some people look to myself. I look to movement, dance. Um, songs, singing to myself. Some people look to just silence, just, just sitting in the silence and allowing um, yourself to be in, in that silence. Um, you know, um, I think that we need a, 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 revolution, a revolu revolutionary shift in the way that we um, bring people together. I, I think that there's a way that we can be much more inclusive of, of, of everyone's ability so that folks don't feel like they have to um, demand um, to be considered. I think that that's sometimes what caused burnout too. It's like, I, I can't do it the way everyone else is doing it. And, and the truth is, I think that a lot, a lot of us are faking it. <laughs> um, like I'm dyslexic. And so for reading for me is not the easiest thing I, I might do um, because I kind of see the beginning of the sentence, I see the end of it, and I kind of piece it together for myself, and I've had to sort of figure figure that out. It's not necessarily easy, so it takes me more time. 
So it's just gonna take me more time to respond to you, to um, get back to folks. And if that means I'm losing opportunities, if that means that there are folks who can't deal with me in that situation, then they can't. I can't shift that, that part of myself and I'm not prepared to um, put myself in a situation of endangering my own health so that someone else feels better about their own work or their own sort of um, expectations. Um, yeah, I don't know if that helps at all, but, but yeah, it, it has to be your, your choice, your, your, your comfort. And, and you discover that by trying different things. Sometimes meditation doesn't work. Sometimes sitting in one spot doesn't work. Sometimes going for a walk is not possible for you. Um, it is reading. So you just to figure out the things that actually bring you joy. If you sit with yourself and you're like, what brings me joy? That might be the thing that you try. I just want to say something about this topic um, too. Um, in terms of groups and um, there's a, a, a activist, Daniel Hunter, in I think in Pennsylvania, who's, who's, who's oh, well, he, I don't know if he wrote the thing about groups, but it's groups can be made up of, of different people, such as the visionaries, the spearheading people, the nurturers, the strategists, the nuts and bolts people. And um, I guess it's been found that in activist groups, there's often a lot of really, you know, visionary go-getting people right out there. And, and sometimes there needs to be, they need to be balanced by the, you know, the people who make the cup of tea or remember to the book the hall or do the research or, so it's a really useful tool for, for bringing awareness to how a group can function. And then if you've got those caring and nurturing people in your group, they can look out fish, especially for the people who have, who have more those needs that maybe aren't being, aren't being met in the group. Um, but it's, it's, for me, it's always been really important to try and be inclusive. And because everybody has something to, everybody has something to bring right along the huge continuum to the people who are getting their, putting their bodies online, getting arrested, you know, to the little old lady who writes a letter to the editor of the newspaper, or, you know, there's a whole range of spectrum that is invaluable. Leah or David, any last thoughts? I guess I'd like to just, uh, I want to thank everyone uh, for all that you're doing <laughs> in helping end war. And I just uh, encourage people again, if you don't already have a support community of people where you live that are really working on this together, try to find those people. Uh, I think that can be a really important, um, I mean, what, for, for us personally, but also for our, uh, as a community and for the world. Uh, I mean, it's gonna be communities of, 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 uh, of support uh, and people who are living the revolution, who are living the values of love and uh, uh, compassion and uh, empathy, et cetera, for each other and for people that are working with that can really, um, I mean, we don't have to wait until after the revolution has happened. We can begin living it now. Thanks again to everyone. All right. Well, I think that we are going to wrap up now. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this webinar. Thank you so much to our panelists for sharing your stories and your expertise and your years of activism with us today. Um, we did record this webinar, so we will send an email in the next couple of days with the link to the recording as well as links to additional resources so you can follow up with all the organizations represented on today's webinar. So thank you again, everyone. And thank you to Rachel Small, our new Canada organizer who has been helping behind the scenes for this entire webinar. So thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good rest of your day. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Greta. Thanks, everyone. Greta, thank you, Rachel. Thank you.